Good morning. Uh, thanks, Per Espen. Thanks, uh, uh, Inge Jan, uh, for the very warm uh, reception. Um, it's always special to come to Oslo. It some, somehow feels it's almost fallen out of the global context. It's sort of it's uh, uh, Oslo is in a way um, uh, a model in its own right. Um, I think what I want to say is that we can't afford not to consider the global context. Uh, I think what I want to say is that uh, acknowledging the global context is the single biggest opportunity that we have. Uh, and I think what I also want to say to be loyal to the theme of uh, the conference is that cities are an excellent starting point for that. Um, um, how to get started? Um, uh, one thing that reminded me that we can't ignore the global context is this. Um, it was three days ago that I found this about a thousand kilometers away from every shore. Uh, the sorghum, I'm not sure whether someone knows what that is, that's essentially the start of the European food chains because uh, that's right in the middle of the North Atlantic. That's a gyre that's uh, uh, where you have uh, uh, rootless seed grass, which in fact feeds a lot of the ecosystems of the North Atlantic, but it's also where plastic accumulates. Uh, uh, I've got six children, so my best guess is that's a one-year-old. It takes about four years to be in that state of degradation. So it's probably a five-year-old girl now, boy now, somewhere, and I wondered uh, how they feel about uh, what their plastic does in the middle of the ocean. We can't avoid the global context. Um, something else that taught me that we can't avoid the global context, and that's perhaps the only reason why I'm here, is um, I spent uh, 20 years with a large consultancy, uh, McKinsey, before three years ago I started Systemic. The one thing that struck me and that didn't leave me anymore is how CEOs, executives are caught between that global context and their very operational context and they can't bridge it anymore. Uh, what we're discussing here, a new model of regenerative growth or uh, a circular regenerative economy might be a way to bridge those two realities. That's why it's important. That's why uh, it's close to my heart. So let me start all together. That's, if that is true, then I think we are talking about a different um, uh, model at, um, altogether. We are talking about uh, a new paradigm. Who of you has read uh, Thomas Kuhn's Structure of a Scientific Revolution? It's still the best book if you ask me. It finds the best language, what it feels like if you are moving from one regime to the next. Um, he published the book in 1964, and uh, he sold more than uh, 1.4 million copies, which is a lot for a scientific book. Uh, sales are up, the publishing house told me, which is interesting, because we feel that the ground is moving under our feet. He was the first one to say, look, knowledge doesn't stack up, and we're not getting smarter by the day. We have referential models that explain, that help us to understand what the reality is about. And all of a sudden, we are making observations that don't seem to be congruent anymore with that paradigm. Uh, and we call them anomalies. And then there's more of them, and then the old paradigm, the old way of explaining the world starts getting into crisis. We find a new paradigm, and the old one dies. And all of a sudden, we are unable to, to, to see uh, the rabbit uh, uh, once we see the duck. Uh, and we shake our head over how we have been, uh, what we have been calling the norm. And we have all seen it in uh, political terms, in economic terms, in uh, scientific terms, in social terms. When I started school, I tell my children, uh, teachers were uh, allowed to smoke in classroom. It's a new paradigm altogether. Now, um, I think we need to talk about that for a short moment when it comes to the economy. That's a major point I want to make, and uh, bear with me for uh, three or four minutes talking about the economy at large. O all the way towards the mid-80s, we had almost parallel development of all the, ma the lead indicators of the economy. That is labor productivity, that is GDP growth per capita, that is median family income, uh, that is employment, but that's also any reasonable measure for societal progress. Uh, but since the mid-80s, we see a great divergence. And two of those dynamic gaps that are being created here, the yellow arrow and the red arrow, are really getting uh, very tangible in our life today. The yellow arrow is that between uh, labor productivity and incomes might be behind the explosive uh, political development that we have seen in recent years. And that's not what I'm going to talk about, but we need to be aware of it. That's important context for us. The red arrow is the difference between growth and any reasonable measure for progress. We are growing ourselves poor. We are stagnating in the way we should measure wealth, and we are stagnating. That's different. That's the duck. That's not the rabbit anymore. 
Um, if that's true, then we quickly have to understand what this whole growth thing is about. First of all, we need to celebrate growth. It would be cynical at best if we didn't, particularly out of a European perspective. Um, in the 20th century, the global economy grew from 1.2 trillion towards 47 trillion. And even in the last 20 years, we took a billion people out of poverty. So we, can't, we cannot not uh, celebrate that. But uh, at the same time, we want to understand sort of what is that engine really that is so important to our, to our life. And um, uh, Jung, we just discussed it. There are sort of uh, different schools of thought. Uh, I grew up in a generation where it was all about neoclassical growth theory, so, which is, uh, again, 1964. Uh, Robert Solo, who taught us that it's really about capital accumulation and labor. That drives growth. Um, we do know from empirical data that uh, that only explains 30% of growth, and I'd always, I always wondered how a theory gets away with only explaining 30% um, of what we can empir empirically observe, and we call it elegantly the solo residual. And that has been around forever, and we still keep learning that um, we have neoclassical growth model, but there is a solo residual. There's a new school of uh, economists that take a different view, and it might appear quite intuitive to us. They say it really is the addition of natural resources that we start to put to useful work. Uh, exergy, they call it, and perhaps in future years that word exergy actually might be part of first year economic education. Uh, we've just had a massive resource bonanza, and uh, that <coughs> essentially the full role of uh, solo residual uh, for 100 years of data from the US or 50 years of data from Europe is being explained by natural resources put to work. And that's very important to know at a moment where we want to grow more because OECD economies are growing less. Uh, decade after decade after decade, growth is coming down. And if we want to heat up that growth engine again, and if we do it in the way that is so resource intensive, there is a risk that we are in fact heating up the engine in such a way that we get uh, the kind of growth that we don't want. We don't want to grow ourselves poor. And that's exactly what empirically has happened. If you ma <coughs> if the, the wider the definition is that we take for real progress, for real wealth, for real growth, uh, the clearer it is getting that we are not improving but that in fact we are shrinking. So whilst we had 2% growth, if you just take an economic measure over the last 20 years, if you include the concept of social capital, and then if you include the, so the concept of natural capital, you can show we have been shrinking uh, by 0.2% over the last uh, 20 years. That's different altogether. That's the duck, that's the rabbit, any, uh, not the rabbit anymore. Now, this is a way to tell the story in macroeconomic language. Uh, there's a way to tell the story in business language. Um, an analysis with 100 resource-using sectors showed that only four of them would be profitable if they had to pay the full resource bill. So we would all be broke. So not only are we growing ourselves poor, we are also earning ourselves insolvent, sort of, if you will accept that language. So that's, again, that's, sort of, that's, that's different altogether. It's a new paradigm. That's, it's, uh, it's a new world in which we woke up. That's the duck that's not the rabbit uh, anymore. That's business language to describe the problem. Here's uh, Earth system language. Um, three topics that we are quite sort of busy with um, in uh, wor working at systemic. Um, uh, plastics. Um, uh, Three years ago, sort of, I uh, we wrote a little article which then go, got, got viral where we said um, it could be that in 2020 uh, there's three kilograms of fish to one kilogram of plastic in the ocean and that by 2042 uh, we have as many, m much fish as plastic in the ocean. That's a new world altogether. That's not a side effect. That's right at the heart of the production function. Um, or take biodiversity. Um, um, if, if you measure, if you weigh all the vertebrates that we have on the planet, and if you ask yourself which share of that is human beings in terms of weight, which share of that is uh, livestock, and what share of that is wild animals, um, what's the percentages? So, uh, uh, fun, fun fact, not so fun fact. 33% uh, uh, is human beings, 64% is livestock, 3% is wild animals. That's a new world altogether. Or take climate. There is this uh, uh, 
um, we ever since autumn this last year, we know that we want to arrive in a 1.5 degrees world, not a 2 degrees world, because we are losing so much on the way from 1.5 to 2 degrees in terms of coral reefs, in terms of human lives being exposed to extremes, uh, but also in terms of agricultural productivity. We want to land on 1.5, it's important. Uh, if we do that, we have to do two things. On the one hand, we have to introduce the carbon law, which says every 10 years we have to cut our emissions by half, by half, by half, by half, so that we <coughs> uh, uh, safely arrive in 2050. But even that, which goes all the way towards bending the laws of physics, it's about as radical as anything one can imagine, even then, uh, we have to do something on top. We have to, by 2030, install 10 gigawatts of CO2 remo uh, gigatons of CO2 removal, which is something which both in terms of technology and business model hasn't really been invented yet, or at least not being scaled up yet. Again, that's a new world altogether. Or we can use um, the language of development economics to describe where we are, and uh, probably this is a chart which is very familiar to you. Uh, uh, we want to live in a world where everyone uh, has a human development index bigger than 0.8. That's the life we deserve, uh, a good life, health, longevity, um, security, income. So that's very much the right of the line. Uh, but we also want to live in a world where our ecological footprint is below 1.8 hectares because that's the regenerative capacity of the planet. That means the problem is that as we grow rich, we are leaving that safe operating space. We are taking off and it takes us to the up right hand quadrant. Um, the, there's only one place on this chart where we want to live to the right and where we can live to the bottom and that's the right bottom hand, uh, right bottom hand side. Uh, as you see from this chart, that's an empty space. Now, um, what to do about this? Here's what we can't do about it and we can't which is we can't grow, grow ourselves green. Green growth, at least the way some of us define it, that we automatically get less resource dependent as we grow rich, is not the way out. And the, uh, the so-called Kuznets question, that's how economics refers to it, sort of is getting absolutely evident just by looking at the chart because the, the resource intensity sort of peaks far too late, far too high, and then sort of we are decoupling ourselves far too slowly post peak and there are too many big countries, the Chinas, the Brazils on the left hand side of this chart sort of to actually take us there. So we need to have a different approach altogether. Uh, and this could be the approach, at least the architecture of the approach. Uh, and the left hand column uh, is in fact something that should give us confidence. It's uh, abundant clean energy. Whilst we are far away from really having it, uh, we, for the first time, can imagine what such a world post-2050 could look like. It's thinkable. It hasn't been thinkable 10 years ago. Now it's thinkable. Abundant clean energy. And we do know what's, uh, how to define such a world that has abundant clean energy. A massive departure until 2030 from two-thirds of coal, one-third of oil, um, and some gas uh, as an intermediate. Now, that's the left-hand column. But in the same way as we have to decarbonize our energy sector, we have to dematerialize or decouple our industrial sector. And that's the material backbone that's on the right hand side. So we have to find ways to grow and build prosperities and cities without putting more resources to use. But even that is not good enough. We only, that only helps us if we are able to build those new economic systems that um, uh, are high performing and that uh, create prosperity, mobility systems, housing systems, food systems. And only, and that's the fourth point, once we see that this is a very cool way of creating prosperity, only then will we be able uh, to build a new um, referential model which means we can grow in a net positive way while so we can build our economy whilst natural systems thrive. So that's the new, that's the architecture of a solution. Now, uh, a bit of history, uh, sort of perhaps it's self-serving. Um, uh, four years ago, the European Union was asking the question, could this be a way out? They called it the circular economy package. There was massive discussions on the level of the, uh, of the European Commission, uh, to what extent that's a good idea or a bad idea. Uh, Ellen MacArthur, a friend of mine and myself, who have been touring for the last 10 years, 
um, we had the chance to put our lock in the fire and to, uh, and to offer our thoughts in front of the European Commission. And we had different ways to tell the story. One way of to tell the story was, look, uh, Europe is very resource dependent. We are importing 760 billion every year. Uh, so isn't that a good reason to decouple? And we didn't tell it that way. Another way to tell the story would have been to talk about the environment, which we, again we didn't. We talked about structural waste in the system. And we said, let's go to one of the most advanced economies, Europe. Let's go to one, some of the advanced sectors, mobility, the food system, and the built environment system, and really check uh, how much waste we build into the system. And the answer is very evident. You know where I'm going. Um, uh, take the mobility, which is on a product level such a mature system that you can only improve it as you cheat. Well, I'm from Germany. Um, uh, but on the systems level, it's hugely inefficient. The car is only used sort of it's parked 92% of the time, 1.2% of the time, sits in congestion, 1% of the time. Um, you are uh, uh, you are looking for uh, for parking space. Uh, uh, only 20% of the energy actually um, is translated into kinetic energy, and only a thirteenth of that again is used to transport the passenger. 50% of our cities are, are used up by traffic space. Out of five seats in a car, you're only using 1.2. Um, so by all intents and purposes, even in a very modern age, it's still a very uh, resource-intense system. You can tell the same story for the food system, where only 5% of the nutrients actually make it into the human body, or only 10% of the water makes it to the root of the plant. Or you can tell a story about the built environment sector, where um, sort of, uh, only 35% of a commercial building is typically utilized. So, um, uh, and then we sort of took it one level up and said, look, uh, here, is what we, here is our performance in terms of using resources in a modern economy. Uh, this is Europe. That's the average product. So the statistical mix between a coffee to go and an A380, if that sort of exists. Um, and th this is a world in which a product has a lifetime of nine years. Uh, where um, after nine years, after one life cycle, sort of 95% uh, of the value is gone. And we accepted that. That's a social norm. That's the rabbit. Um, and only 50% of that is utilized. So the first point that we made, by all intents and purposes, we live in a very resource-intensive world. The second point we made, it can be different. Uh, and the answer is technology. And we have all seen it, what it looks like if, a, uh, if an industrial system is being completely turned around. We have seen it in retail. We have seen it in media. We have seen it in, uh, uh, in private banking. Uh, we start to see it in the power sector. We are seeing it uh, in the mobility sector right now. And I think we'll be seeing it across all physical industrial sectors very soon. And we've said, if we apply all the different levers that uh, uh, resource decoupling um, offers, we call it resolve because uh, it needed to have a cool name, regenerate, share, optimize, loop, virtualize, and exchange or substitute. Um, and if you build a system according to those principles, what do you end up with? So it's not the individual car ownership, it's this world in which cars are connected and autonomous and electrified. Um, and shared, importantly, uh, and uh, build cradle to cradle. Or in food systems, it's not about volume, it's about quality, it's about nutrient recycling. Uh, or in built environment, it's about modular housing, fluid space, better materials. Then you can actually find out that this is a much more affordable way, not resource efficient way, but affordable way to generate that part of prosperity. Um, and uh, so it would, in fact, if we do that, be a major relief on the uh, household bill of a European family. And then we said we are, have some confidence that this is a good idea because even today there is significant economic uh, uh, proof uh, that some of these business models start getting into the money. And some of those businesses that are using the resolve opportunity are amongst the fastest growing that at least I'm aware of. That was the next point that we made. And then we said we don't, technology alone doesn't get us there. Um, because we do know historically that product innovation also always tra travels faster than systems innovation. And there is a risk that we are putting those new super products 
into the wrong systems context. And that's why we need to define not products, but systems, and for that we need principles, design rules. And guess what? We think that those uh, design rules sit in the, in the school of thought of the circular economy. And so we try to draw it on paper, and that was my first attempt 10 years ago to draw uh, the circular economy, and with a bit of pride, uh, that has been downloaded now uh, 75 million times, and it seems to uh, have struck a chord. Uh, so it's a world in which uh, there are three principles where A, you need to decouple from virgin. Secondly, once you have taken resources into use, you need to use a ma maximum utilization over and over again. And then thirdly, you need to design it in such a way that it doesn't create spillovers to other systems. And if you do that, you are creating this butterfly world where you have the durables on the one ha hand where uh, they keep circling again and again and again, um, which uh, requires you importantly sort of to reinvent the whole concept of uh, the market economy to the extent that you stop selling products. My kids would say selling stuff is so 1990. In a world of data, you don't sell stuff, you sell performance. You don't sell fridges, you sell freshness. You don't sell tires, you sell kilometers. You don't sell uh, smartphones, you sell connectivity. And by doing that, you for the first time have the incentive sort of to, to keep uh, durables in circulation. And all the uh, consumables need to be designed in such a way like my shirt that they stay part of the biosphere and can easily return, which is clearly a design rule that this product uh, failed uh, to adhere to. Now, uh, and then we took the next story and, uh, step and said, let's now imagine and describe very concretely what those systems would look like and describe them economically. This is a long uh, sort of uh, conceptual journey. Here's the, what we arrived at. We, we think, if you model that in an um, equilibrium model, that this is, could be a world which for a European economy could promise uh, <coughs> uh, within the next 15 years another 7% of extra growth. And whilst you have to believe in economic models, which you should or you shouldn't, um, if that was true just for for the sake of this conversation, uh, that's a half a percentage point of extra growth. And that was exactly the reason why 30 years ago we in Europe entered the internal market. So if you want, this could be a political or economic project of the same order uh, of magnitude. So it promises extra growth. That's why politics likes it. There are 10 countries in Europe alone that sort of have a circular economy strategy now. Um, other uh, world regions also um, uh, drive this agenda. Uh, China sort of called it circular economy first, so they owe the name rights. Um, I had to tell Alan. Um, but then now they call it uh, in the 14th or 13th and then 14th five-year plan, they call it ecological civilization, which is a very nice word if you ask me. Um, the, uh, the Japanese, they call it resource efficiency. The um, uh, and the, uh, the Canadians, they call it uh, smart prosperity. It's also a nice one. Europe calls it circular economy. In the way, it's the same thing. So, but it also sparked the, the, uh, the, the imagination of companies um, uh, who ask us sort of how could we actually um, get uh, circular altogether, not just more efficient, um, not just by reconfiguring our supply chain, but by really shifting our business model so radically that we stop being a fertilizer producer, but we are a yield insurance, that we stop being an OEM for automotive, that we start being a mobility platform, that we stop being uh, a chemistry producer, but that we are in fact a materials uh, platform for the processing industry. Now, that was the theory of the case. Sort of, we at Systemic always ask ourselves how, sort of, how to change systems, and you need the three talks. You need to have a theory of the case. That's what we just talked about. We need to convince ourselves that the old ways don't work anymore and that there's a better one. The second question you need to ask yourself, where's the theory of change? Where does the energy come from? Where the pressure point? I think currently, from my discussions, there are three pressure points. There is a reason for the plastic industry to reinvent itself because the pressure is getting so high. There are really companies under pressure now. Secondly, there is the mobility industry, which completely needs to rethink its, uh, itself uh, as we are moving into electrification. And then thirdly, there's the food and land use agenda, where we don't accept the uh, massive uh, wastefulness of that system anymore. So that's the theory of change. Let's go for those areas where uh, the pressure is highest. 
And largely we need a theory of catalyst, the third talk. Where is in fact our acupuncture intervention uh, starting best? And I happen to think it's cities. Cities are the level of governance, the level of science and the level of value chain ownership where you can actually start, uh, start building it. And cities are the place because cities are uh, the biggest users of resources and they will move from 50 billion uh, to 90 billion by until mid-century and they will, if we continue just to use the construction materials in cities, just to give it an order of magnitude, be a user of half a billion, uh, a half, uh, sort of 500 gigatons of CO2, which is about the entire budget we still have. For that reason, we have to rethink the conception of a city altogether. Um, we have to make them more uh, denser, we have to make them more diversified, we have to make them more uh, accessible and we have to link up cities in completely different ways. And one sort of experiment as I'm coming to a close that we did a year ago together with the Al MacArthur Foundations is to rethink the city as metabolic hubs for nutrients. Currently, uh, most of the, um, the nutrients that are being produced on the field, they're entering the city, they're never leaving it again. Can we rethink the cities as metabolic hubs for nutrients that are returning um, their, their nutrients uh, to the field and can we reinvent the food system um, altogether. Um, there is a global agenda now with more than 40 cities that have actually signed up to the idea of how can we build urban food systems, A, by reconnecting ourselves to regenerative agriculture and to peri-urban farming, B, by recycling our nutrients altogether, uh, and there are some Norwegian companies who are uh, uh, particularly well positioned to own that part of the technology chain. Uh, and thirdly, how can we move to a new generation of protein sources and out of that disrupt something uh, and or create the next good disruption, this time in something that is as important as the food and the land use system. Now, because time doesn't allow me, I'm going to stop here. Driving um, system change is something that went very close to our heart. We found out that with the measures of conventional warfare uh, of a consultant, we don't get there. That's why we created something new. This is Systemic. It's a very small firm. We only started three years ago. We have 140 people. We are in London. We are in Munich. We are in Jakarta. And we are across, we are trying to make new land use systems investable. We are trying to make new energy systems investable in new circular industrial systems um, investable. And we are trying to steal as many talent from the right and the left and to create a new profession around system level change. Um, we might have a case because one way to, say, uh, to tell the story of the world into which we are uh, moving is this as I end. Um, we will be growing with something like 3.5% um, over the next years to come. Rule of 70, 70 divided through 3.5, that means 20, doubling period of 20. Over the next 20 years, we are doubling our global economy. Everything we have ever built since the beginning of time, uh, which is a 75 trillion global economy, we will build again. Uh, and it's absolutely clear that that new next economy needs to look different from the one that we have built in the past. And I think it's time to grow up. Thank you.